Okay, number 62, the biblical truth of our hymns. Because he lives. And this is an interesting one that we're going to look into more of the background. Based upon John 14, 19, because I live, he also will live. And it's the most requested. And it's written by Gloria and William Contemporary Music Singers. Gather. Gather. It has been rewarded by recognition of the Gospel Song of the Year in 1974, Gothic Gospel Music Association. And in 1971, when this was written, there was social upheaves, there was possibility of wars, national betrayals, and personal trust. And then such a world that these two were going to have a baby. Bringing in their third baby. With assassinations and drugs. And war in the headlines. And uncertainty of assurance of lordship of Christ. Blew their troubled minds. And they wrote how sweet to hold a newborn baby. The stanza, too, with confusion of the times and era. Because it was a troubling era. The world has gotten there full of the devil and darkness. And we've all come to those times in our life. They were born in Alexandria, India. And by the 60s, chaotic era, values shifted. And they, be they began to wonder, as far as the world, has God given up? And it was 1969, a hard winter. More hard than usual for, the, for that area. And Bill had been struck with monoleukiosis. And in that time, his wife, members of their church, began to encourage painful false accusations and belittle them. Well, that wouldn't happen amongst Christians, would you? You wouldn't think Christians would downplay other Christians. And thus, it was a hard time for Bill and Gloria. And in agony as a new year is coming across, a nation in the education system of America, God is dead. Even preached in the pulpits, God is dead, and drugs were going to the ultimate high, as they are today. And hope going. Again, with their pregnancy, why would we bring a baby into the world? And the story is that Bill and Gloria and a friend were walking in, in a lot. And George called to Billy, Bill and Gloria's attention that in this lot paid. A grass blade had pushed aside layers of the concrete, blacktop, rock, and dirt. And that blade of grass had reached the sun. It had a strong will to live. The odds of what man has done to that lot, that blade of grass, reached the sun. And the gatherers took that blade of grass as hope in God's creation. Whatever man can pile upon, life in God in Jesus will bring hope. And through that blade of grass reaching out where it should not have reached out, 
the impossibility. It shaped for them the resurrection of Jesus. And to their son. As she was pregnant. And this world will give you hopelessness, helplessness, doubt, fears, and troubles. And yet Jesus says, he has overcome the world. The world hates Jesus and Christians. And I stand amazed how churches and Christians hug and adulterate and hoard them themselves with the world. John writes to us that if you are friendship with the world, it, you are in enmity against God and God's against you. God sent his son. God did not send a woman. God sent prophets, but he didn't send the prophets. He sent the prophet that would be likened to Moses. God sent his son and that son is the beloved of God, the only begotten son of God who is God. And they called his name Jesus. Emmanuel. God is with us. Jehovah saves. To the imbecile of the Jehovah Witnesses that do not believe that Jesus is God. Yet, Emmanuel, God is with us. One of the few but good number of children in the Bible who were prophesied and pre-named like Isaac and Solomon. And when you find a child like John the Baptist who has been prophesied and you're going to call his name like this, you will see a type of Jesus Christ. Even in Ishmael, he was prophesied, and he was given a name before he was born. He said, well, what could Ishmael be a type of Jesus Christ? The whole world hates him. And Jesus is at odd with the world. When you reject the finished sacrifice of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have the love of God. You've been lied to. He came to love. You say, well, you just said, yeah, I know I just said. That's right, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But that love ends when you reject Jesus. That love will not return until you receive Jesus and repent of your sins. There is the wrath of God for those who do not have the son. And if your preacher and your Christian friend or whoever tells you the love of God, what did John say? He that has not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God. And when you die without Jesus Christ rejecting the gospel, God is not going to love to put you into hell. That was your choice. God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. To heal. Well, did he ever heal Paul? Paul says, I, I, I spoke three times, thrice, on the, on the thorn, the messenger of Satan. Did God heal Paul? No, he didn't. And forgive. I take that heel out. Because there are born again Bible believing Christians that love the Lord and serve the Lord and do and try to do what the Bible says to do and repent of their sins and ask God to forgive them their sins and they are not healed. Got a problem with that word heal. But forgive? Let me tell you just recently. As a born-again, Bible-believing, saved Christian, I went to the Lord with many sins that I had 
confess and I have not confessed since I was saved. After I was saved, when I backslid and went against God, I asked God recently to forgive me those sins. I, I named off the sins that I've done against God. For the Bible says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, He forgives and for forgets. He lived and died, that's the gospel. And was buried and rose again the third day. To buy my pardon. Now that's a great word. Because pardon is the word that says, I am guilty. Innocent people do not get granted a pardon. And a governor, president, or a warden in a, can go inside a prison with a stack full of pardons. And our government has handed out pardons, and when the gov when the president leaves office, he pardons a certain amount of people. The proper definition of a pardon is someone who is guilty of the crime. Jesus Christ would never need a pardon for Pilate and Herod said, I find no fault in that in him. I need a pardon because God would say, Hey, I can name your sins. The ones that are unconfessed, I can name and I've written them down. Behold the eyes of the Lord in every place, beholding the evil and the good. I know you're a sinner. Do you know you're a sinner? Yes, I do, Lord. And I got a pardon for you. And when you approach God and you hear someone preach to you, you hear someone teach you, and you hear someone give you the gospel, and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, God says, are you a sinner? Oh, no, Lord, I'm a good person. I'm a good church person. I'm a good Baptist. I'm you don't get a pardon. I said this prayer. You don't get a pardon. An empty grave. That's the third part of the gospel. You know what differs religion from Jesus? An empty grave. You know how many religious hierarchies are still in the grave? You know how many pastors and teachers and elders and deacons are in the grave but I know God manifests in the flesh I know they buried a dead body in the tomb three days and three nights later the angel proclaimed he's not here he's risen that's not religion you know when you can go visit the bones of the body in the tomb of your religious person hierarchy you got a religion but he's still there dead buried Is there to an empty tomb is there to prove my savior lives? Isn't that doesn't that sound weird? An empty tomb where you bury dead bodies is because my savior is alive. That's one of them oxymorons. You don't listen, I got family members and they've died and they're in a graveyard. I'm not gonna go to that graveyard to say, hey, you guys are alive. And that angel proclaimed to those women, he's not here, he's living. And I think it's the fact he says, why seek the dead among the living? Something like that, paraphrase. Well, because we're in a graveyard and because Jesus was, is dead. That's why we came in. We brought the spices, we bought the ornament. We're going to prepare his body for the burial. No need. You're in a graveyard, you're at a tomb for the dead and he's alive. There you go. How sweet to hold a newborn baby. Again, that reflects the Gatherer's family. During time of turmoil in this country and the nation and all that, like, here comes a newborn baby. You know what? Time of turmoil, time of trouble, time of tribulation. One day, Jesus is going to be in the sky. And we're going to hear a trump and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those that remain shall be caught up together in the clouds. And from there, we'll go up and see Jesus. And if we're not alive when, when Jesus comes and we die, we get buried, we're still going to see Jesus. The, those that have died in Christ are going to rise first. 
Listen, times of troubles and turmoils are going to end one day, whether we die or whether we're raptured. When we die, that's it. We're absent from the body and present with the Lord. No more bills, no more troubles, no more problems, no more phone calls, no more mail. We are with the Lord Jesus Christ. And realize when death happens, when the rapture happens, there will be no more faith. If I die today and I'm absent from the body and present with the Lord, if the rapture happens right now, I will go see Jesus and be on the cloud. That's it. My faith is done. I've seen Jesus. I am with Jesus. I am now truly a believer. Leave the mess behind. I've had family that have died and go off to glory, and I've envied them because they're not suffering no more. My wife was suffering with cancer and she died in a hospital bed in my arms and she's been there since 2010, nine years. And man, she, she glorified. She is with Jesus. I am not. But I still witness for Jesus. I still get the gospel out there. I still repent of my sins. I still try to do it. She has no more faith. She's with our Savior. And feel the pride. I hate that. Tell you right now, there is no pride in Christianity. Well, there is, but God has no pride. Pride, proud, boasting, loftiness are all sins. I removed that line. I, I, it gets me. Preachers say, oh, "I am so proud of." No, don't you know? Pride and pr being proud is a sin. God has no pride. He he says. He doesn't say, oh, I'm so proud of you, you're number one. He doesn't say that. He says, well done. When he talks about Jesus, he doesn't say, I'm proud of you, my boy. I'm proud of you, son. He said, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. And I would change that verse to be something well pleased. That's scriptural. I remove to heal and remove feel the pride. There's no pride. If you got pride, you need to repent of your sin. I know a couple pastors that got pride. A couple more came into mind. That tears down, that breaks down. That becomes the Nicolaitan. You know, look, look, look at me, the hierarchy, and you low people down there. The joy he gives, absolute joy, is one of the fruits of the Spirit. When you become adopted by the blood of the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he suffered and died according to the scriptures, and was buried and rose again, when you become saved, and the Holy Spirit comes to dwell with you, you are adopted as a child of God, and the Holy Spirit brings his fruit, and one of them is joy. There's no other joy but the joy of the Holy Spirit. Now you can go into craft stories, you can go into stories, and you get these signs, love, joy, family, peace. That's a bunch of hogwash. That's to get your money out of your wallet. And to get the true joy, and get the proper joy, and get the holy joy, it doesn't cost you nothing. It doesn't get put on a plaque. It gets in your heart through the Holy Spirit by the testimony of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and believing and repenting of your sins. That's how you get the joy. It don't hang on a wall. It's in your heart. Taking the phone away. I like taking the phone away. But greater still, the calm assurance. You know what that is? That's another fruit of the Spirit. Peace. Peace is like joy. It is that fruit of the Holy Spirit when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you repent of your sins, and you become a child of God, and that comforter becomes part of you, in you, dwelling with you, that Jesus said, and then that comforter, peace. Listen, I've been troubled trying times, and I've had people look at me and say, How are you doing so calm? I didn't feel calm. But Christ liveth in me, the Holy Spirit dwells in me, and the world said, Man, You're calm. That's, well, that ain't me. That's God. And I'll tell you the truth, I'm shaking and quaking. Calm and sure. You know what insurance is? I'm saved. I can't lose it. I'm never going to lose it. These things have I written unto you that you may know you have eternal life. No man plucking them out of my Father's hand. The assurance. I am not ever going to lose my soul. 
I can lose rewards. I can lose inheritance. But I can't lose a salvation that I don't have the salvations in Jesus. Now, if you got a salvation in religion, you got a salvation yourself, you can lose it. Men lose things all the time. God's never lost anything. This child could face, they're talking about their child. Uncertain days because God lives, Jesus lives. You know what can get you going tomorrow? Jesus lives. A greater hope, a blessed hope, a comforter, a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. I feel sorry for lost people. I feel sorry when they depend on their on their drugs and whatever they do to keep them going. I, I, you got to pay for that. I've never had to drop a quarter into God's prayer machine to get God to answer me. I say, Lord, I got troubles. I got problems. Lord, I need your help. And he comes free. You know why he comes? Because he lives. Listen, I come out of Catholic Church. Mary can't do nothing. She's still dead in the grave somewhere. I don't even know they know where she's buried. Peter ain't going to do nothing. Allah ain't going to do nothing. He ain't no God. But Jesus Christ. Remember we said they went to the graveyard and the weirdest news came forth. You're at the grave. Behold, you. why seek you the dead among the living? Because we're in a graveyard. They buried him. No, 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 no. He's not here. He's risen. That's the difference again between religion and Jesus. He lives. I have a God who wept at a funeral. I had a God who fell asleep on the back of a boat. I had a God that got angry. I had a God that walked, and talked, and healed. And then one day, that's what I look forward to, that one day. I'm waiting for the Lord. Paul says, listen, uh, to die would be a, a blessing. Again, I'm paraphrasing. He says, listen, I'm just here. It's needful for me to be here. But listen, to die is gain, he says. The rapture would be gain. That moment when we looked out, whoa, how the, oh, yeah, okay, this is the rapture. And one day when the Lord says, come up, come up hither. And one day the Lord said, okay, you're done on that earth. I'll cross the river. I don't know where they get that from. I don't know how you cross a river. And like I said, it's got problems. It's, it's good, but it's got problems. You're not going to cross a river. You're not going to have complete healing. And you can't have pride. You are not going to cross a river. And I know Pilgrim's Progress says that, but you don't. You're either going to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Or the trump is going to blow. And if you're dead already, you're going to go up in the clouds. And if you're alive, you're going to go up in the clouds. There's no river. I know it makes great. Uh, you know, if we sing about Jordan and we sing about the, It sounds good for singing, but is it scriptural? I'll fight life's final war with pain. All right? Maybe they will, but there's some people who die that there's no pain. I'm starting to run in a little trouble with his hand now. I'll fight life's final war. Uh, you can do fight. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Thou art my, thou art my rod and my staff. I understand two people have died in my life and they just lay down in a hospital bed and close their eyes and boom, they're gone. They're gone with Jesus. And then as death gives way to victory, and it's true, in Christ, victory, I'll see the lights of glory and know he lives. That's true. Again, that moment that you die, that moment the rapture happens, we go to be with Jesus. That's it. Faith is done. 
Paul says prophecies will, will end. Charity will not. Faith will come to an end one day. When I see New Jerusalem coming down, boom, that's it. I don't have to believe in New Jerusalem. There it is. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. But we're not always given, we're not always granted a tomorrow. What is our life but a vapor? This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Because he lives, all fear is gone. All fear? The fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is clean. I mean, I think we can confess fears in our life as a sin. 1 John 1 9 and still know he lives because I know he holds the future absolutely true and life is worth living just because he lives now let's take that last part for a worldly Christian life's not worth living if you're worldly and carnal You're going to die and end up having your works burn with wood, hay, or stubble. Hebrew says that, you know, enjoy the pleasures of life for a season. Yeah, you can have pleasures in life. But I'm looking at a carnal Christian who doesn't do right and does not adhere to what God says. Life is not going to be worth living because all that is done for Christ will survive and will last. All that is done for self will burn up so if you're worth living for yourself and not for christ there is no future the church age today the latin seeing church age they are living we're great we're wonderful we don't need you god look how wonderful god pat us on the back look how the great numbers and they're going to be in a quite surprised when they find out the heavenly smoke detectors are going to go off from all the fire and flames of their earthly work that they thought they were pleasing God so much and those that are humble and those that love the Lord and those that do right all right life is worth living because Christ is in their life Christ is about their life Christ is totally and they're serving the Lord and doing what Christ has told them to do then it'll be worth living life is worth living for me right now is that I've got gospel tracts out there I tell people about Jesus I witness the gospel I don't come up with nonsense I don't do the worldly means of witnessing and I have the prospect of, of Going out and witnessing in gospel tracts and preaching and teaching people that when I get to glory, I may see people. I get the glory of life worth living when I support missionary. And the fact is, I will see people in glory that I never will meet on this earth. Life is worth worthy when we come to Christ looking at you at the judgment seat of Christ and you have been finished judged and you hear Christ say well done thou good and faithful servant gather the gold gather the silver gather the precious stone come let me give you a crown or crowns and let me give you the inheritance or you can live your life for yourself Go to the judgment seat of Christ. The flames are, are hot and high and the smoke. And there's ashes and dust. And God, Jesus Christ, looks at you and say, You know? You didn't do it for me. You get nothing from me. I gave you talents. I gave you 
thing, talents to do, and you wasted them, or you used them. The God-given talents that God's given you, and you used it for God, life is worth living. God's given talents to you, you used it for self, it won't be worth. So I have problems with this hand because he lives. Personally, I don't think it's scriptural. It's halfway scriptural and it's halfway right. But the devil had most of the truth when he talked to Eve. The devil used scripture when he dealt with Jesus and when Jesus was tempted. But that little twist, a little bit untrue. A little white lie is a lie no matter what. Santa Claus is a lie. But there's a holiday called Christmas. Saying, put Christ in back in Christmas. That's a lie. But there is a Christmas. Personally, again, I say, I would not do this in. Got a wonderful story, got a wonderful testimony, but when it defies the scriptures, what are you going to do? Know, maybe you see it different, I don't. But, what did God say it? Weigh it out with what the Bible said. Lay the hymn out to the Bible and see what it is. I did.